I'm still living in the basking in the glow of camp meeting. So if you got to be a part of that in July, uh, awesome. If you didn't, it is available online and you can catch up with all the wonderful uh, things and nostalgic things as well that we were able to do during that time. One of the things that captured my imagination in our camp meeting time, it was words of life, the theme, the name. And I continue to find little words that speak life to me. And so forgive me if I keep going with sort of one word titles on my sermons for a while, uh, because they're words that speak life, I think, to me and to all of us at one level or another, if we will listen and pay attention to what these words might actually entail. On a side note, I do hope that if you did attend our camp meeting times, any one of the three weeks or two or three of the three weeks, if you go and watch them online, if there are things you liked about that that you would like to see maybe made a more regular part of our service, I hope you'll let me know or Milton know or, or somebody know so that we can begin to think creatively together about how uh, we might carry ourselves corporately in worship and what that might mean because this is, among other things, a kind of home, to use that word. If we're aware, there are a number of things that go into homes. Now, Barbara's here, and she's a realtor, and she will tell you that realtors sell homes. In reality, I think she and I both know, and all of you know, that realtors sell houses, and there's a difference. We prefer the word home because it connotes something more intimate. It connotes a place of belonging. It connotes um, something uh, of, of connectedness and grounding for us. We, we don't say house base, we say home base, right? We think in terms of home being a place where we regenerate our lives and where we live our lives in many ways. So a house it can be a home, but it isn't necessarily a home. A vacant house, an abandoned house, we don't say there's an abandoned home. We say there's an abandoned house. And so there's one sense in which a house is physical. That is to say a home is physical. It is a house or some kind of dwelling. It is a structure from which we hide ourselves from the elements. It is a place where we can find a modicum of privacy and live in accordance with the standards of our society, hopefully. So there's physical structure that comes in the concept of home. That is really, really important, and I'm going to spend some time on that this morning. Then there's the sense in which we speak of making a house a home, and we speak of that process by virtue of what we do with the house itself. How do you make it homey? We use words like, oh, that's cozy. It's, it's very, uh, it seems to me, ambiguous, and yet we all kind of know what that means. There's a comfortable chair. There's a lap blanket. Maybe there's a, an area rug that you just want to run your toes through. I don't know. What does it mean? But there's a sense of comfort within that home. Maybe the colors are conducive to relaxing. Maybe the design is pleasing to the eye. Uh, but we make our structures, our houses, into homes in part through the process with how we line the nest, if you'll pardon the metaphor. There's a third aspect to home, and that is those who dwell within. Home is a very defined sort of thing. When we have an open house, we call it an open house, not an open home. Why is that? It's because those who call it home may have opened up the structure to others to come visit and see and celebrate or be a part of, but they will never necessarily be an integral part of that home. Because home is constructed of family. 
We build a home for ourselves if we're single, and that's legitimate and valuable. We have a sense of our own space, those we welcome into it, and moving from that place into the space others welcome us into. But we also build homes through marriage and through children and families. We build home through extended relationships in terms of those we welcome in and make a part of our household. So what does this have to do with anything spiritual? Lots. Lots. Because when we speak of heaven, we don't speak of heaven as something unrelatable. We speak of heaven as our home. We speak of eternal life as something that comes to us in the here and now and goes forward in time into eternity. So your home, hopefully, is a little bit of heaven moving forward into eternity where we find our eternal home with our Father God. That's something incredible to ponder. Home takes on a much grander scale and larger meaning when we think of the New Jerusalem and we think of the way in which we might live together in that space. But I don't want to talk so much about the future. I want us to think about what it means to have a home. And homes are the houses or the structures that we build together. Where we find our home is not something passive. We're not like tree snakes who seek to find a rotted out knot in a tree or an abandoned burrow in the ground that they can, they can uh, occupy. Homes for us are things that we invest in and construct. In this culture particularly, and in Southern California even more particularly, a home is your single greatest investment, probably. Some of you may have enough stocks and bonds that your portfolio is worth more than your house. Congratulations, and can I invite you to please do a seminar for the rest of us on how we might retire with a little grace. That would be very welcome. But for most of us, our home is our single greatest investment because in Southern California, owning and having a home or building a home requires such a substantial part of our monthly incomes. I think in the United States, the average is supposed to be around 25%. But in Southern California, it's not uncommon for people to spend 45% of their incomes on housing. Huge investment in house in home. Jonathan Sachs, the theologian, writes a very interesting book about the house that we build together. He's concerned with several things. Partly he's concerned with the, with the interreligious dialogue. How do we as a global community build something that connects us? But he's also using something that goes back to ancient times. And this was mentioned just a minute ago in the Exodus text that I used. Let's look at that together. Feel free to turn with me. We read from Exodus 25. And verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Now, Jonathan Sachs points out, and it's true, and I want you to pay attention to this, that you have the story of Exodus, that is to say you have God appearing to Moses in the burning bush, you have God uh, allowing Aaron to join Moses, Moses and Aaron going back to Egypt and standing before the Pharaoh, uh, you have them appealing to the Pharaoh to let God's people go that they might worship God. You have the story of the ten plagues and ultimately the Egyptians paying the Israelites to go. And then you have a journey that begins and takes place over multiple years and many trials. It culminates with them in the promised land. But when you think of the book of Exodus, it literally means to exit or leave, to go, we think of this story, 
and the journey that the Israelites were on. But do you realize that a huge chunk of the book of Exodus is spent talking about the wilderness sanctuary or tabernacle? Now, this tent structure was not very impressive. It was not very big. We read of it, and we read of the various kinds of skins that were used, the gold that was employed, the silver. But these were the things that people worked with, the metals that they had. They did not have steel-framed structures. They did not have glass available at their disposal, at least not in the quantities that would make the kinds of things we build with. In this desert, there was not much wood, to be sure. So the structure was a tent structure, basically. It wasn't grand and glorious. It certainly didn't resemble Solomon's temple in any kind of way. Solomon's temple with its marble and its columns and its gold and its cedars from Lebanon, its massive structure that stood upon a hill in Jerusalem, this grand embodiment of the faith of Israel. No, The temple or tabernacle that God asked Israel to build in the wilderness was mobile and it was simple. It was a tent where he would make his dwelling. Now, Jonathan Sachs points out that as the people were leaving Egypt, the Bible describes them as a diverse group. Have you ever thought of it that way? I had not. You have the 12 tribes of Israel, which were disparate enough. Remember, the 12 tribes of Israel may have come from one father, Jacob, but they came from four mothers. Four mothers. And two of the tribes of Israel came from Joseph, who had an Egyptian wife. Two. So this was a a very diverse group of people. Imagine being raised, the difference, of course, being raised with a family that was all of Semitic Canaanite origin and then one that was half Egyptian. That would be cultural differences. Joseph's children were not the same as the children of Israel raised in Canaan. And there were other differences, too. There had been intermarriage and people coming in, converting to the faith through time. There were outsiders who were counted among Israel. I know this is incredibly ignorant, and I don't mean to be ignorant, but I was shocked when I went to Israel the first time and saw Ethiopian Jews. I did not realize that the diaspora had worked in that way. Here were children of Abraham who presented themselves in Israel, same as Russian or any other, who were Jewish, but had quite a different culture and appearance than necessarily the Russian Jews or the German or European Jews or others, all sharing a common heritage. So this diversity that comes together is not a nation. It's not a nation. It is a wildly divergent group of people. And imagine this too. If you've been a slave, imagine the difference between being a slave to a high-ranking Egyptian, one of education and wealth and power, and a low-ranking Egyptian or common Egyptian. Imagine the difference in the household in which your children would be raised. Imagine your opportunity differences. And then imagine what 400 years of oppression looks like. 400 years of enslavement. So as the children of Israel are leaving Egypt under God's direction, they're anything but a nation. They're a disparate band of people. And Jonathan Sachs points out how the genius of the divine imperative to build me a sanctuary that I might make my dwelling with you was. Because two things happened. Three, actually. The first, God selected specific individuals with very specific talents to make very specific objects that would be in this tabernacle. But the talents of the people as they had them were employed. Two, there was a tax of sorts that was spoken of. 
half a shekel. No more for the rich, no less for the poor. So there was something that leveled the playing field, if you will. And then there were the gifts of silver and gold and furs and other things as people had means. Again, I come back to the notion. If you worked for a wealthy Egyptian whose firstborn son had just died and they wanted to get rid of you and you as a curse, imagine how might they, might they might compensate you compared to a poor Egyptian with a slave or a relatively poor Egyptian with a slave. Israel, as they left, didn't all have equal wealth. Each family didn't share the same amount of goods. Some left Egypt with more than others. And God's call to build me a sanctuary empowered each of them to give according to what they had. Some, the Bible tells us, brought bronze. Some brought silver. And some brought gold. Sounds like the Olympics, doesn't it? The people, through covenant, decided to make God the center of their society. See, God had said, I will be your God and you will be my people. In Exodus 20, we have the Ten Commandments being given. Very important. But not just a few chapters later, in 25, the tabernacle is being built. In 20, the law is given, and in 25, instruction is being given on how that law will be lived out in society. And at the very heart of the tabernacle, in the most sacred place within the tabernacle, in the most sacred object within the most sacred place of the tabernacle, would be an Ark of Covenant. And in the Ark of Covenant would be housed this table of stone, the Ten Commandments, the social contract on which this people would be built and assembled. You see, when God called Israel to make a sanctuary in the wilderness, he called them out of covenant to become a society. He took a diversity and from it made one people. One people. How might that apply to us today? You see, in order for church to be a home, in order for this to be sanctuary, in order for this to be our wilderness tabernacle until we get to our final destination, it has to be something that we build together out of covenant. This is the problem with church. We live in a consumerist world in a society where we're not required to build anything. We're only required or hoped, it's hoped, that we'll deign to give our presence to this something that's been built. Do you hear the difference? Bloomingdale's has put a new store in Glendale in the hopes, in the hopes, that people with more money than me will stop by and shop. But if I should happen to drop a little money there, they won't complain either. You see. Bloomingdale's is counting on folks like me through the beauty of their facade, the fame of their name, and the quality of their products to get me in to buy a $200 pair of pants. Uh, excuse me, $200 pair of jeans. That's what Bloomingdale's is hoping for and counting on. They're hoping that they can persuade me that I don't smell good and that that $85 bottle of two-ounce cologne is going to make all the difference in my life, that my wife will suddenly warm up to me in ways she never has. <laughs> now that I think about it, it might be worth it. No, I'm, just... I'm kidding. I'm very grateful. All kidding aside... That is an example of a corporate structure that's been built for the purposes of marketing and selling something. So when I think about our church and the way in which we want to market ourselves to the world, that has value. 
We have to do something to get people here. We have to provide a product, if you will, that somebody is interested in somewhere along the line. We need to be able to establish relationships that would create trust in such a way that somebody might be interested in hearing more about our message. And we're inheritors of a house that's already been built in a way. The denominational structure is there for us. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is incorporated as such. It exists. But when it comes to a church, a home, a sanctuary, the society that inhabits this doesn't get dictated from above. The society that's created here is not created by outside dictums. We have 28 fundamental beliefs we get to wrestle with and interpret together. We have things that can bring us together in common in terms of a shared denominational identity, if you will. But it's not the same as the society we create here. It's not the home we build together. It's not the tabernacle in which we live. You see, we're a diversity here, a tremendous diversity. I'm not just speaking in terms of Oh, socioeconomics or race or culture or gender are the usual things that are listed when we think of diversity. We're a diversity of tribes and families, if you will, too. Coming sometimes from very disparate places. The thing that took Israel from mob to society and made them a great nation were as follows. They had a covenant with God who said, I will be your God and you will be my people. If you keep my commands, I will make of you, I will bless you, I will bless you, I will bless you. And if you don't, you'll suffer the consequences. And that is the history of Israel. I can summarize almost the entire Old Testament in just those two lines. You read the stories, and as our, our, one of our Sabbath school classes is studying First, Second Samuel right now. If you read those books, the Kings, the Chronicles, this is the story of listening to God and not listening to God, of blessing and curse. But out of Exodus, not only came covenant, but came a society that would be built. And what went into it? All Israel agreed that God would be their God. And then what was required? Everyone had to contribute. Now, it just so happens, I did not plan on this, and it, it, you know, it's nothing contrived, but it just so happens you gave me the perfect illustration this week. You didn't even know it, did you? The perfect illustration of what I'm talking about. Here's the insert. And it says last week's giving, $881. Does anybody know what 881 times 4 is? How about 881 times 52? Quickly. I see the mathematicians crunching in their heads. Nine times five is 45, yes? It's about $45,000. That's the house we're building together. It's a $45,000 house. Is that what we want? Do we want a house in which 20% or 15% or 25% of the people are contributing 100% of what's available for us to use? How can you possibly experience the full sense of belonging, of this being home, if you've never given anything to making it that? You invest in your homes. Don't tell me you don't. 
You invest in your marriage there. You invest in parenting there. You invest in pest control. You invest in mowing the lawn. You invest in painting the eaves when they start flaking off. You replace windows when they no longer keep the heat and cold out. You buy new carpets when they get too worn, stained, ugly, or the dog is thrown up on them too many times. And you don't spend dollars or fives, or tens. You spend thousands of dollars doing that. That's home. That's home. What kind of society do we want to build? Do we want to continue supporting or working for, working with a structure in which not everybody is invested, where it's consumerist, where a few of us through our donations and a few of us through our time make something that gets marketed to everybody else to just come use but not to commit to. You see, covenant calls us to commit first to God and then to one another. That's covenant. Covenant says, I am my brother's keeper. Covenant says, I belong to you and you belong to me because we belong to Jesus Christ. Covenant says, your success is my success, and my success is your success, and together we're the body of Christ. Covenant says, we're called to something greater than this earthly tabernacle. We're called to a tabernacle made by God, in which we'll all dwell, in which inequalities will cease, in which grace will be equally distributed to us all. We have an ideal of a heavenly, a heavenly home yet to come, but we haven't achieved it. But Jonathan Sachs is right. There's no home, there's no belonging without giving. There just isn't. And so I look at you and I say, what kind of home or structure are we building together? What does it mean? I tell you what, 80% of you are not going to want to come to this church if we're forced to live with a budget of $45,000 a year, including me. There was a time, some of our old timers will tell you, there was a time when this church had 25, 35, 45 people a week in it. There was a time when there were no pews and they sat in folding chairs. There was a time when all they had was the hope of something bigger, something greater. And you know, I don't want to hear it. It's all about money. It's all about money. It's all about money. It's not all about money. Money is only a symbol. It's only a tool. And this symbol says I'm in. The symbol says where my heart is, my treasure is going to be. The symbol says, I'm going to invest because God has called me in covenant to be with his people. Money is just a, a symbol of that, a symptom of that, a tool for that. So God calls us through tithes and offerings to bless one another, support one another, and take care of his church. And that's not the main point of this sermon. What do we want to build together? Now go to Galatians. Go to the New Testament package, passage we picked out. Galatians 5. We think it's all about rebukes on things that don't have anything to do with us. We think that this speaks to sins that are not our own. Let's see, drunkenness, not me, orgies, not me, um, hatred, well, maybe sometimes, but probably not me, idolatry, witchcraft, not me. We think this isn't about us, but this is also about the home we want to build together. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Does that echo Exodus at all? No? I can't hear you. Oh, thank you. I know you're there. I just, um, you're thinking, okay. Think a little faster. No. 
You're called to be free. You're called to be free. That is Exodus. But don't use your freedom to indulge your sinful nature. Serve one another humbly in love. That's the house Paul wants us to build. Serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law, everything that was held in the Holy of Holies, in the Ark of the Covenant, everything that was important can be summarized in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. It's pretty powerful. If you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. Ah, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the the desires of the sinful nature. For the desires of the sinful nature is what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit's what's contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, and we went through those. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's another kind of house that we build. There's always the physical structure, but there's the mood. Have you ever gone into a house and just felt crummy there? Or any other space? Maybe some of you don't have that sensitivity. That's okay. I have entered spaces where I could palpably feel something wrong. I have entered spaces that immediately made me feel sad or depressed or anxious. I have entered spaces where I had a profound sense of the presence of evil. Have you had these experiences? That's what Paul's talking about. Now he's talking about a tabernacle that's not made of gold and silver and bronze and pillars and skins and fabrics and curtains and furniture. He's talking about a tabernacle that's the society in which we share in this space. He says, don't let selfishness and immorality govern your life, but let the Spirit rule. Because against things like joy and peace, gentleness, goodness, love, etc., there's no law. What kind of house do you want to build? What kind of home do you want to live in? What kind of space do we want to occupy together? Let me put forth this vision. I would like to see this be a thriving community of people selfless enough to give of their money and their time and to serve one another in humility, love, and grace. You will not be able to stop the church of God when it gets to that. You will not be able to stop the church of God any more than any of the foreign powers could stop Israel. When Israel lived in covenant, they never lost a war. When Israel lived in covenant, they never failed for peace. When Israel lived in covenant, they prospered. They made progress. They went the way God called them to go. And when they went their own way, disaster befell them. What kind of home do we want to build? I pray it'll be a place of spirit and peace. I pray it'll be a place of blessing. I pray it'll be a place where you can invest life's energies knowing that God has already saved and rewarded you and will continue to take you forward to the end. May God bless us all on this journey. And now because we don't have a formal call to giving, I want to pause and say thank you for your faithfulness and stewardship. I would like our deacons to come forward at this time to collect your tithes that we return to God and the offerings which are gifts to God vis-a-vis the family and for this home 
that we want to create together. Amen.